My name is Darren Drill. Uh, it's kind of a little bit weird to hear Superintendent Drill, but okay, that's my title. Um, I generally get called Darren. If, if you want to talk to me later afterwards, you want to call me Darren, please feel free to do that. Um, I'm a resident over at Almsville. We've lived there about nine or 10 years. My daughter graduated last year from Cascade and uh, love being in this community. It's been fantastic. Our goal tonight is to get you guys to give us some information about how we're going to spend this money, okay? And what essentially happened is this. I'll give you a, a really quick rundown, right? It's about a little bit of politics. So for years, since 1992, three, right in there, right around the time that, that the state of Oregon passed ballot measure five, it shifted the tax burden away from local communities and to the state. And it sounded great at the time. I remember my mom and dad talking about it. My, ta my property taxes are gonna get capped. And there are these naysayers over here that said, hey, you know what? That's really gonna cause schools to, to struggle. And as a matter of fact, right around that time, if you do a little history check, the state of Oregon at the, t at the state level spent about 48, 49% of its entire budget on education, particularly K-12. At one point in the downturn in our economy six or seven years ago, the state of Oregon was spending about 36 or 37% on education. Now everybody always says, oh, you get more money than you've ever had. That's true. Most of us make more money than we've ever made, right? So as the costs go up, so does the, the amount of money that we get. But the percentage always didn't fix itself. And now over time, that percentage has worked its way up to 43, 44. And with this money, it pushes it very close to what they call a quality education model. So when they quit giving us the amount of money that schools really needed, the state of Oregon required the legislature, by law, to write a report called the QEM, or the Quality Education Model. Okay. And that model basically said, if you had an elementary school, and if it had 400 kids, how many teachers should you have? How many aides should you have? How many principals or vice principals should you have? How many counselors should you have? Right? And, in, and instead of giving us the money, they'd write a report and say, see what you're missing? This is how much money you're missing. And essentially, the last time they did that, about three years ago, and I'll have to write one again here pretty quick, it basically said that the state of Oregon was about $2.4 billion short on what they truly needed to help K-12 education, okay? And we can debate about how it gets spent, and truly there are places in the state of Oregon at the K-12 level, including us, that you know, we're like, wow, that wasn't a good way to spend the money, we need to find a better way to do that. I totally agree, right? Over the last few years, we feel like here at Cascade, we've done a pretty good job of that. And the reason why I say that is there's some evidence, right? We generally are at or just above our state level with regard to testing. So when we test our kids, we generally figure it out. We don't, our school board or my bosses generally says to me, you know what, that's not the most important thing. Let's make sure that we produce really good citizens, right? That's the most important thing to them. And then you start to take a look at some of the other indicators. Well, the, the one that's the most noticed that they talk about all the time in the state is graduation level, right? What's your graduation rate? And we hear all the time, Oregon's horrible. They're way at the bottom. You're absolutely right, they have been. But for the first time in a long time, they actually reached 80%. So as we've gone through this process and Oregon reaches 80%, for the last three years, our high school at Cascade has actually been above 90%. This last year, it just came out a couple weeks ago, our graduation rate is 94%. And of the 355 high schools across the state, we are ranked ninth, right? Only West Albany in the entire Willamette Valley has a better graduation level. We missed them by 1%. Right? We beat South Salem, we beat Sprague, we beat West Salem, we beat Lake Oswego High School. Right? This is an impressive feat. At ninth grade, they have another benchmark. It is ninth grade on track. We know by research that if ninth graders have finished so many credits that they are most likely to graduate from high school. The graduation or ninth grade on track rate for the state is about 83, 84%. Ours is over 97%. So tonight is about, let me explain how this works. And like I said, the state finally said through the legislature, hey, we're going to do a tax, which was controversial in and of itself, and we're going to make that tax go to K-12 education. We're going to give most of that money to K-12. There's a little bit for zero to five, and there's just a little bit for higher ed, not a lot, but a little bit. We were the big winner in, with the money. The legislature also said, guess what? 
mostly Democrats, right? We stuck our neck way out. We created a tax. There are some people that really aren't excited about it. We're holding you accountable <laughs> for all that money. We want to know details about what you've done with the money. But we also wanted to make it as flexible as we can. Mm -hmm. At the state level, what it looks like when they go around the state and look at Portland Public versus Redmond versus Medford versus us. So how do we make that work with regard to parameters? They want the money spent. They want to know what you spend it on. And the basic parameters are around a couple of things. One, even though we have a graduation rate at 94%, right? That leaves 6% out. And what I can tell you about the 6% is that if you look at them and you break it down and you use the data, these are kids that are generally economically disadvantaged, right? They don't have moms or dads like you or aunts or uncles or grandmas or grandpas at home helping them with homework. Some of them, their parents are doing two or three jobs. Some of them don't have parents at all. We have a number of kids that are homeless, right? As does every district. Right? We have kids that are in special education. They have a reading disability. They're dyslexic. They can't pay attention long enough. Whatever the case may be, we've got to deal with those kids. And we have kids that are learning English, the ELL students that are trying to figure out so they can accomplish the American dream. That's what they're trying to accomplish. Right? Those groups of kids, as we watch them and track them go through, they don't do as well right, as like my daughter. My wife and I both went to college. We both have an opportunity. You can bet, just like you guys probably do, right? Where's your homework? Where is it? Get it out. Let's deal with it right now, right? All those fun conversations you've had to have with your kid as they grow up, right? So how do you focus on those groups of kids, right? And then how do you focus on other things that could help along the way? Kids need social emotional help. What about suicide rates, particularly the high school and the middle school? And now... Right? We're seeing those conversations at the higher end of elementary school. How do we handle that? What, do we, what does that look like? How many more counselors can we provide? These are the questions that we're going to ask you. Okay? And our goal is to get as much information from you as you can, as we can. So we can try to figure out what it is. Are we going to do exactly what you say? Probably not. The goal is to try to find the balance. We want to hear from you. I certainly want to hear from our staff, which we've already done. And I want to hear from our administrators about, can we find some common bridges where, hey, you know what, these themes make sense. The upside to Cascade's money is that for now, and apparently for the next couple of years, we know that right around $1.8 to $1.9 million per year comes our way. That's about 8.5% of our entire budget, right? This is a significant increase in how we handle the money. So imagine, right, suddenly you get that much more, you feel a lot of pressure to make sure that you spend it right. Two billion dollars with a B, right? That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money, which from my perspective, after 26 years in education, is about time, right? Because running around without enough money is just, you need the money to get, get it done. I, I always hear everybody tell me, you need, to, you need to spend it smarter. I promise you, when we went through the recession, yeah, before that, you know what? We probably didn't spend it as smart as we could have. But after the recession and trying to save jobs and make sure that our kids were okay, right? It got to the point where we were just cutting and slicing into bones. We got rid of all the, the fat, then the muscle. We were down to bones. So it's time. It's time to have the investment, right? The Student Success Act was broken into three parts. And this is the part that we're talking about, the 50%. Right? The biggest bucket is the 50% that we're going to talk about tonight. The early learning accounts, what I talked about, the zero to five, how do you do that? What does that look like? More kids in preschool. That's a great conversation. I would love to continue that conversation, but for tonight, it's about the other piece. Right? How do we do that? And there's a whole different agency, surprise, surprise, that does early learning at the state of Oregon. Okay? And then the bottom one, the statewide education initiatives. I had a couple parents talk to me tonight about Ballot Measure 98. We passed that about three or four years ago to provide CTE classes, right? We finally got the bright idea that all kids don't need to go to college, right? Lots of kids need to go out and work, but they need the skills to do that, right? And there are a number of jobs that pay very well, almost as well or better than if your kid went to college. Electrical linesman, plumber, electrician, right? There's all kinds of these jobs out there. And over the last few years, we have added, particularly at the high school level, and Mr. Thatcher's here tonight, you can ask him those questions. How do we do those kinds of programs and help kids? And we see the fruit of that labor already. So 
This is what the purpose is. This is what the legislators told us and told the Department of Ed that that is the purpose of this student investment account, right? Look at the areas. I talked about a little bit about those areas that they really want you to focus on, right? Here's the thing for us. It is really about kids in poverty for us. I don't have a large group of people in the other areas. I got some kids with students with disabilities for sure. But for our community, it's about poverty. It's about kids and parents that can't afford or take the time because they're working the second or third job to be able to manage the, the things they need for their kids. How can we use the money to make up for that? Summer programs, after school programs, what does that look like for us? It doesn't necessarily need, mean that we need more days in the school year. It might mean that we do after school programs or things that are hands-on, more robotics, things that can excite your kid into saying, I want to stick in school. How does that work for us? These are the buckets they told us we can spend. I've talked a little bit about that, reducing class size, like I mentioned. Like you take Turner, for example. Mr. Peterson tells me he's completely full, 100%, more kids. I know for a fact there's a room around here that he probably uses for something. I don't know if that's really true, but I bet you I could find one. Um, we could probably add one more room. But after that, the problem is for lots of school districts, there's no more extra rooms just lying around, right? So as I mentioned earlier, how do you add other adults into the room? That might be a different way to solve that problem, right? How do we manage that? And if we talk about in terms of instructional assistance, that really helps us because I don't know if you realize this, but last year in Oregon, right, about 13 to 1400 or, uh, people out of the state of Oregon that went to schools to become teachers, they produced about 13 or 1400 new teachers, okay? There's 198 school districts. The top 10 school districts needed 1,800 new teachers. 1,800, okay? We didn't produce enough teachers to make that work. Now, I'd like to be able to tell you that it's great because this is a wonderful community. Come down here and teach. We got great, you know, we got great insurance. Uh, we pay okay now. We got better at the pay here this last year. Um, but we don't, we don't pay the way Salem pays. I'm not the machine Salem is, right? It's different. It's different here. I know. And I don't, I don't, you know, we've lost people to there. So how do you manage that? When I talk to their superintendent, she says alone, I'm need, I need to hire 250 new teachers next year. It's a machine. So how do we manage that? Maybe we hire more instructional assistants. They generally live in our area. If we do all the right kind of training and they continue with the training, maybe we even pay them more. We're sticking around. That seems like a really good way to go, right? Well-rounded education. Now you're talking about TAG. What else can we do about special ed? How can we handle social emotional learning? How can we manage additional electives? One of the reasons why we get a 94% graduation rate is at the junior high. We've done that. We do this really weird trimester thing that you hear about, right? It's kind of like if you've gone to a state college, it's, it's basically a term. At the junior high, our administrative team decided that all our kids for all three terms, right, will go through uh, social studies, English, math, and science. Did I get it right, Debbie? Pretty close. Okay, good. Um, that means they get a year and a half each year. That means the electives aren't as much, but that's okay. We think they're more prepared when they move into high school. I think that's important along the way, okay? Instructional time, like I said earlier, for some school districts, it's like we need more days. We are actually about, they count it by hours technically, the state of Oregon does, the ODE does. We're actually way over, which I love, right? And I appreciate all of our staff doing that. So if we do a late start because of snow and we don't make it up and you wonder about that, we're way over with regard to counts. We're okay, okay, with regard to the, the instructional time. But for us, does that mean, do we do after school programs, summer programs? How do we enhance those things? Do we even start with four and five year olds so they know how to behave in a, in a kindergarten classroom? We have, as we, as we evaluate kindergartners, and we're required to do that every year, every year we have some students that really struggle to even know how to behave in a, with a group of other kids, right? Maybe your child has come home and mentioned it, right? Because they probably have. How do we help those kids, right? We have to take them by law. How does this work, right? Then finally, health and safety, right? Appreciate Chief Taylor's here tonight. You know, he's here in plain clothes. Sorry to identify you. 
but at Turner Elementary and at Almsville Elementary, we have a great relationship with our police officers. We really do, right? At Cloverdale, at our alternative center, and at the high school junior high, it's Marion County, right? And I'm just gonna tell you right now that if they're up the canyon, it could be a while before an officer gets there. So if you're talking about health and safety, how do we make sure that we have an SRO, a student resource officer, a true Marion County Sheriff sitting there or somebody through Turner or somebody through Almsville? We actually have a police officer on campus that can go to Cloverdale, that can go and that time shrinks. We can get them there quicker. Along with that safety idea, how else can we do that? What other kinds of locks can we have on the door? How come, can we have more cameras? What are the things we can do? What are the things we can spend money on to ensure the safety of our kids. That's included in the process. We can spend the money there as well, okay? We've done a needs assessment. We've done a district SIP. Educators love acronyms, okay? And I think I'm gonna get this right. The, the, what's the, what's the C stand for? Continuous, <laughs> continuous improvement plan. We actually have to write it so the state looks at it and says, what are your big goals? Our two goals are math across our K-12, right? and making sure that as administrators and as teachers, we look at data the right way, right? Okay, that sounds a little, I had somebody say to me, that seems a little vague. Yes, it's very vague. It's intentional, then we can go all kinds of directions with it. If we see a need, then we can move in that direction. Staff survey, we did that last fall, and we asked the staff to do this kind of exercise just the, uh, last week. We're down, to, we're down to just the high school staff that's left. We gotta have them do it next. Student survey we're working on, we're gonna actually ask at certain grade levels, at, that, at their level, hey, what do you think we need in school? Right? Stakeholder forums, we're doing that now. And then how do we prioritize that stuff, which we're gonna ask you guys to do, okay? Here are some of the things we've already seen as trends from our district, pull, pulling out from the data. You can just kind of take a quick look at that. If I said to you, some of them seem vague, would you raise your hand? Yeah, okay. And again, there's a little bit of education speak going on, but at the same time, it also allows us to be a little bit flexible about what that means, right? So there's a little bit of a balance to it. It's a little bit like, hey, we didn't realize it would look a little bit like this at Turner versus Almsville versus the high school. We don't wanna write it so specific that we're stuck doing it that way. Because when we're done with this plan, I've got to hand it to my board who says, yes, that's okay. It's got to go to the Department of Education. They have to bless it. And then it comes back to us so we can do it, right? We want to make sure that we have it flexible enough that we can make adjustments if we need to, okay? Here's the roadmap in typical fashion, right? They said, hey, guess what? We passed this bill in, in July and August and in September, right? You need to start talking about it. And hey, in July, we're going to give you the money. Okay, now listen, I've, this is, I've done this job for, thir this is my 13th year, okay? I was the principal before that, I was the vice principal before that at Cascade. I have never seen the Department of Ed move this fast, ever, okay? But what I'm suggesting is, as they're hiring some people to make this happen, I'm trying to trust them. I'm gonna smile and nod. They promised me in July the money will show up, okay? All I gotta do is jump through all the hoops to get it. Okay. I know the money's there. My finance director has ensured me that the money is there. I just got to hop, hop through all the education stuff to get there. We're right here in January, February. In March, we're going to submit our basic plan after our board looks at it. The um, state of Oregon has a team. They're going to have different teams look at it, including parents and educators. They're going to look at the plan and go, what does this mean? What does that mean? Otherwise, they're going to give us a thumbs up. We go through to June. We get our board to agree, and the, and the money moves forward. And then we get it, in theory, every year. We have to write a new plan every year. We have to make adjustments, and we get it every year. That's the goal. Okay? So, we're going to have a QR code. You're going to be able to hit that thing. We've got some people that are going to help in the process. And you're going to be able to do the, um, the survey, and we're going to go from there. Before we get there, are there any burning questions? <laughs>